Good afternoon. Um, welcome back to uh, Father PJ's classroom. Um, we are going to delve back into our RCIA, I guess you could call it, but our faith uh, learning experience here. Um, and what I'd like to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to learn once again. We thank you for the opportunity to delve into your mysteries the mysteries of this beautiful faith that you've given us. We ask you to help us to understand these things more and more so that we may fall more deeply in love with you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what, exactly what we're going to talk about today, uh, that uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, that is the deepest mystery of our faith. The Trinity is what we call it. Just to rehab, uh, hash a little, uh, last time we talked about uh, the existence of God and um, because of his existence um, and because his existence is his essence, he is the uncreated creator, the unmoved mover. Um, and he creates us out of love, uh, out of a complete and unnecessary and unmerited love. He creates us. And not only does he create us, he creates us with a free will that at one point, uh, fell with our first parents, but has been given the opportunity uh, to come back to him time and time again through um, his merciful and salvific plan. Um, but today we want to talk a little bit more about who this God is, who this person is that we're talking about. We've So far we've called him the unmoved mover, the unchanged changer. Um, I've even used the word God to describe him, but what does that mean or what does that look like for us as Catholics? Well, I want to begin with describing or defining, um, maybe giving a little bit more insight into uh, that symbol that you see all Catholics make, right? Um, this symbol, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's how we know somebody's Catholic, right? If you want to know if somebody's Catholic, you look at it, uh, them making that sign of the cross, and you say immediately, hey, that person is Catholic, um, or at least they're showing some sign of of the Catholic faith. I know I do that when I, when I see a football player do that on the field or whatever it may be, uh, it kind of makes my heart flutter a little, you know? Oh, oh, he's Catholic. Maybe he's Catholic or maybe he's not, but that certainly is something that defines somebody as Catholic. Um, so where did that begin? Right? So we'll start, start class here a little bit with a, some fun note. Um, well, that the sign of the cross began in the year 313. That doesn't mean that Christians weren't using some other symbol. They were uh, to identify themselves. And we have to remember that for the first 300 years or so, or 200 years at least, of the existence of Christianity, they were a persecuted people, right? Our, our ancestors were persecuted by uh, Rome and by other countries. So they needed a secret symbol uh, to identify themselves, okay? Um, so there were, really wasn't a public symbol that they would have used that would have been well known, that would have uh, identified them as Christian out in the world because they couldn't. If they identified themselves as Christian out in the world, um, you know, that, that was the end. So they had to have secret symbols. That's where we see things like the Cairo, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the P and the, uh, the X. And, um, you know, so we see those symbols or the, um, even the Alpha and Omega put together in a certain way or the, uh, the you know, the, the Pix, I think it's the Pixius, uh, the, the Christian fish symbol. Right? All of those great symbols, ancient symbols of Christianity, that's where those come from. But the sign of the cross, that public sign of our faith, began in the year or about the year 313. So here's the story, the, the kind of uh, um, history behind it. Emperor Constantine is in the middle of uh, this great battle. They called it the Battle of the Morovian Bridge. Um, it was a battle to save his empire. And so a little history on uh, Emperor Constantine, his mother became a Catholic or became a Christian, right? At that time, everybody was a Christian. Um, same, you know, same practice and same everything. It didn't, Christianity didn't look like it did today or it does today. It looked like the Catholic faith. That's just the truth of it. Um, that's how Christianity started was with um, all the practices that the Catholic faith has, um, all of its uh, truths, that's, that was the Christian faith. So we were all called Christians right? All of us. So his mother decides to become a Christian. 
convinces Constantine to become a Christian. Well, once the emperor is Christian, everybody's Christian, right? At that time, whatever faith the emperor was, was the faith of the empire. That's where we get the Holy Roman Empire. Constantine takes on the Christian faith. Boom, just like that. Rome is the Holy Christian Empire. Okay, we go from being persecuted to being on top of the world. Crazy how quick that happens. But Constantine is in the middle of this battle, right? And it's a battle to save his empire. Like Rome is on the verge of falling, right? To marauders, to these barbarians. Um, and he has this dream. And in this dream, Christ gives him the cross and told him in this sign is victory. So Constantine the next day has all of his men paint that cross on their shields and on their armor. And they won the day, right? And that cross became an outward sign of the Christian faith. In this cross, there is victory. So that's what we are saying to ourselves when we mark ourselves, in this cross, there is victory. We remind ourselves of the cross of Christ, right? And we sign ourselves with that as an outward sign of the inward faith that we profess, right? What does it stand for? In the name of the Father, okay, the head, the creator, the Son, we point to our heart, right? That the, the Son is... Um, his salvific and merciful heart, and the Holy Spirit from one end of the earth to the other. Um, the Holy Spirit uh, dwells on the earth and acts in all of us um, in our entire person. Okay? Um, so uh, another way to look at that is uh, bless our thoughts, uh, bless our feelings, and bless our actions. Okay? Going back to... Um, so that's uh, that's just a, a kind of a, qu a quick intro into our uh, into uh, our faith, right? With the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, what does that look like? And how do we know um, as Christians that we have this triune God, that we have this trinity of a God? Um, and, and, and where do we get all of those truths? Okay, St. Thomas Aquinas would point to um, a watch, right? We look at a watch and... We don't know, we may not know anything about the watch, but if we open up the watch and we look at the insides, we say, wow, that's pretty intricate, All right? So a watch washes up on the beach, we pick it up. We're going to look at that and say, somebody had to have built this. We're not going to look at that and say, wow, that must have been randomly put together in the ocean. And that's pretty cool. No, we're going to say, hey man, somebody must have put some time into this. And somebody must, uh, must have made this. So by seeing the watch, we know that there is a watch maker. I hope that makes sense. Um, we call that watch maker God. So by looking at the universe, by simply looking at it in its orderedness um, and, 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 its, um, and its, its beauty, we say there is a universe maker. There's somebody in charge of this universe. It's too meticulous, meticulously and beautifully put together for us to say this was just random, right? And, and once again, we can see that in the human body. Like, wow, you know, I, I mean, look at this. I mean, I tried to cut my thumb off the other day. I mean, look at that. I didn't do it on purpose. Um, I was slicing potatoes. But the, the fact is, you know, at the time, I looked at that and I thought, man, like there's, there's no reason that should heal. That's pretty bad. It was a pretty bad cut. Should I have gone to the doctor? Yes, mom, you're right. I should have probably gone to the doctor and got stitches. But I don't like stitches, so I didn't go and get stitches. But my body's still healing it. It may not look the best, but it's still healing it, right? That's amazing. That's amazing that our body does that sort of thing. But by simply looking at those things in the universe, we can know that it's not this random um, set of, of things that just happen to have fall to, fell together, Okay. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, even those people who uh, preach that, you know, you take a Stephen Hawking at different points in his uh, life. He actually, if you look at his history, Stephen Hawking commonly thought to be the smartest man in the world of his time, right? You couldn't call him an atheist because he went back and forth. Why? Because he cannot find, he cannot satisfy the, himself with the fact that the, the world could not randomly have come together. He tried his whole life long to get that to scientifically work, that the world could randomly come together the way that it is, but it's impossible to rectify. 
Um, right? Even the, the smart guy now, I don't even know his name. Um, but the, uh, the, you know, the world's smartest, smart, smartest atheist, he still exists. And you listen to his arguments. His arguments are still based on there being some sort of natural law. Right? There being some sort of natural law that exists. But to say that that natural law just came together out of randomness, well, that's absurd. Right? I mean, that's, that's a completely absurd statement. We know that there had to be something that ordered that together. Why do we know that? Because you can't reproduce what we've seen. It's, it's impossible. And it would be possible uh, to eventually reproduce some of these things because we're operating within the same realm and laws um, that uh, have been created thus far. So things, the way that we know nature reacts and the natural laws that we see, things would naturally um, come together the way that they have naturally come together now. But I digress. The point is, uh, we look at a watch, we look at uh, the universe, and we see and we know that there is a maker. Okay? So we break down that God and that we're talking about, this, this, this godly creature, and we say, okay, what does he look like? Well, we've never seen God. There's nobody who's ever seen God. Moses was probably the closest one to see God. Jesus saw God, but he is God. Um, but so no completely human person has seen God, at least a person dwelling on this earth. Um, and we can't contemplate God in his entirety. Why? Because we're not God. There's always going to be a mysterious part of God that we're never going to be able to understand, that we're never going to be able to see. We are limited beings, even in heaven, um, as infinite beings, we're still limited. We're not God, right? So we'll never be able to perceive him in his entirety, but we can grasp the little insights that he's given to us. Um, if you will, we can grasp the watches that he's given us, and we can understand that there has to be somebody behind the watch. So what has God given us? Well, he has revealed himself in three ways, right? And we call it, we call those the missions of the persons of the Trinity. So we call the Trinity three persons in one God. Why? Well, he's been revealed to us as three different people, three different persons, not people necessarily the way that we understand it, okay? Persons in the way that we're never going to understand, not fully anyway, but we've been given glimpse of. What do I mean? What does this look like? Okay, the first one is God the Father, Right? or God the creator, okay? What, is that, what does that mean? Well, that is the mission that we see from this particular person of the Trinity. He is the one who creates, and he creates out of nothing, right? That's, that's, that's impossible for us, first of all. We cannot create out of nothing. Sometimes I think we think we can, but, but we can't. We've always got to start with some sort of matter, some sort of uh, something. But he literally creates out of nothing. There is nothing and he creates and puts into uh, space. Okay? So he creates out of nothing and he creates out of uh, this excess of love. Right? If he's always changing and he's always, uh, or if he's, if he's never changing and he's never moving, or at least nothing's causing that, that means that he's always changing and he's always moving. Right? So there is this excess of love that he has and this unfathomable power that he has. But he creates out of that. Right? Um, he creates out of um, this, this uh, incomprehensible amount of love and power that he possesses. Think of it this way. Um, human beings, when we look up at the stars, we can see, they, they think we can see about 3,000 stars with the naked eye on a good night, obviously clear night, Milky Way, whatever. We can see about 3000 stars. There's billions of stars, billions upon billions. The universe is incomprehensible to us. Even our galaxy is incomprehensible. We, we cannot possibly uh, understand all of that at once. And God is beyond that. Okay. So that's what we're dealing with. But God takes that power and he focuses us on us individually. So he creates in a big way, but every single thing that he could, or every single thing that he creates 
has been comprehended and has been thought about, contemplated by our God. Right? He takes that time to think about us individually. That also makes him our father. Right? To, to focus on us and to love us into existence and to give us exactly what we need to eventually be with him one day. The fact is we exist explicitly because God wants us to exist. He loves us enough to create us and then not only just to create us, but also to help us with every single one of our individual problems, right? Not just helping on this uh, wide scale way, but helping us individually with every single one of our problems. That is part of why we call him father. While on earth, Jesus, his son, called him Abba, which means daddy, right? God is our daddy. You know, he's the one who takes care of us. He creates us and takes care of us and wants to see us do nothing more than to come back home to him. But this tells us in order for us to be like God, our father, we have to give him our whole heart in return. He shows us the way. Right? Constantly thinking of us and, and reaching out to us. And we can never match that infinite love. So the only the appropriate thing is for us to give him all the love that we can possess. All the love that we have. That's what he asked of us and that's what do, is, is, that is what is due him. Follow me, I have a, a trouble speaking this evening. Uh, but... So we have him revealed as God the Father, but it doesn't stop there. If God wanted us to understand him as this singular person, he would have stopped right there, and, and that is where our story would, have, uh, would be focused. It's just on God the Father, this creator. But then he gives us God the Son. Okay, this is important to note, and this is where the Trinity gets very tricky. God the Son is the, he is one being with the Father, but a different person. Right? We're never going to understand that. I'm not saying we can't grasp it in some ways. Right? That's what we're going to try to do is just to, to get a grasp of it. But to say that we're ever going to understand that mystery fully, that's, we're not. Okay? We're not. That doesn't mean we don't try though. Okay? We do. We keep trying and we keep trying to understand these, these persons more deeply in their own way. But God the Son is not separate from the Father. He is one, one being with the Father, but a separate person. How do we know that? That's the way he's been revealed to us. We didn't choose uh, to, to make God look like this. He chose to reveal himself in this way to us. So what does the Son look like? Well, he's not separate from the Father, but he is his own person. He's begotten is what, we're, is what we're told. He's begotten by the love of the Father and proceeds forth from him. Okay, so their relationship is this perfect relationship of love, right? This is important. That's important because that relationship is what we are called to take part in, right? It's not our relationship. I mean, meaning that we don't create that relationship. We're asked and we're invited to be a part of that relationship. This eternal, mystical, love, perfect love relationship that the Father shares with the Son, which is absolutely beautiful. And we'll touch on that many times as this course goes on. But um, the, the Son proceeds forth from the Father, okay? What do we know about him? Well, he is the Redeemer, okay? So the Father was the Creator, okay? The Son is Redeemer, He's the one that brings salvation. We see that in the Gospels, right? Everything that we learn about Christ is pointed toward his relationship with the Father as his Son, but his action as Savior, okay? This Redeemer, this, this Son, Jesus Christ, decides to be all or like us in all things but sin. In order for him to do this, he has to, in some mysterious way, which is the second great mystery of our faith, which we'll talk about next time, but he takes on humanity, which means to a certain extent, he has to set aside his divinity while retaining it, but basically setting aside some of the benefits of him being God to take on our humanity to truly experience 
our humanity. Why does he do this? Well, he does this in, in order to relate to us, right? He wants us to relate to him through his humanity, through our humanity, right? If he's God and he's just above us, we relate to him as, um, as human to God, as created to creator. Now the sun comes and it changes the game a bit because we relate to him not just in that manner. We certainly continue to relate to him in that manner, but we also relate to him now as man to man, right? Human to human. And it, the thing to remember too is, and as I said, we'll unpack this a little bit next time, a little bit more. Jesus doesn't just put on uh, his human body oversuit, right? He's not just, oh, hey, now I'm human. Oh, wait, now I died. Now I take it off and throw it away. No, once he takes on humanity, he now has two natures, right? Now he has two natures in one person. He is both human and divine, and he must be in order to redeem us perfectly. Okay, so hold on to that and, and just ponder that for, for now. But because he becomes human, Christ brings us into adoption by the Father, which, once again, is how Christ helps us relate not only to him, but relate to the Father. Right, as Christ is Son to the Father, he takes on our humanity allows us to share in that relationship with the Father. So now we relate to the Father as Father. Instead of just as my creator to me, this is now my, my uh, Father and I am his son. I am his daughter. That's incredible. And that, that is very different than a lot of religions out there. God is not just our overlord, right? He's not just, he says you do. Right? He is actually someone who wants a relationship with us. A relationship that of like or a relationship like unto father to son, father to daughter, father to child. He wants us to participate in that with him. Incredible. So um, this is what's important of this is uh, we, we all realize we have differing fathers. Right, we all we all realize that we have a, di a differing. Some of us have great dads, some of us have bad dads, some of us are somewhere in between. Okay, God is the perfect Father, and Christ wants us to know that. He wants us to know that because He wants us to know that we have a perfect Father, no matter how our earthly father has been. That is how well our God understands us, and that's how much He wants us to be in that relationship with Him is to offer himself as perfection where perhaps imperfection lies. It's incredible. We look at, back at Christ, look at this person of Christ, this person of Jesus, the Son, the Redeemer, and it's through his humanity that we also glimpse his divinity. Right? We, when we come to understand his humanity more and more, we also come to understand his divinity more and more. And what his words and what his prayers and what his thoughts all drove us to, okay? And it all drives us to the heart of the Trinity. This triune God, you know, one being, it drives us to the heart of that, okay? And once again, through his salvific act that he completed as a man and as God, but through his humanity and then through his human suffering, we get to share through baptism in that relationship, that divine relationship um, that they share, that the Father and Son share through their same nature and through this relationship that they have. From that love relationship that the Father and the Son share, we then get um, the proceeding forth of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we see this at the end of the gospel when Jesus reaches out to us and he says, hey, I, there is one to come. I have to leave so that another may come. He tells his apostles that. Um, and we see the Holy Spirit show up in the Acts of the Apostles. What is his role? Well, we call him the sanctifier, right? The Holy Spirit stays, is, is proceeds forth from this love relationship of the Father and the Son to come and be with us on earth and to spread the grace and the glory of the Trinity on earth 
and to spread uh, God's presence throughout the world so that they, that may remain to guide us closer and closer to the Father and the Son. We see the Holy Spirit given to us in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus sends forth the apostles after um, he gives them his spirit. He says he's going to pass on the spirit. We see at Pentecost in the Acts of the Apostles, the spirit descending on the, Holy, or on the apostles. He, at that point, he enters into the world and he is acting and working through us and in us all the time. We see the gifts of the Holy Spirit, things like courage, strength, wisdom, um, and more. He gives us those gifts so that he can guide us toward the Father and the Son. And we continue in return to ask him for that guidance and courage to live out our faith. Right? So we look at, look at this, and obviously, like I said, this is, a, this is the, the bare minimum of the Trinity. There's so much depth here. We took an entire semester in seminary on this. And we talked about the Trinity. Obviously, he's, our God is, is, is everything. So we're talking about him all the time. But this is just a brief understanding. So we look back on what we've just talked about. But we understand the Son and the Holy Spirit through their missions. right? That's how we come to know who the Son is. Through his mission as sanctifier as, um, or as, uh, as redeemer. If through his mission as sa- savior in this world being sent to be like us in all things but sin, uh, to grab a hold of us basically, basically and give us a chance to once again live as we ought, as sons and daughters of God, of his Father. And the Holy Spirit, we see him as this, uh, um, as this sanctifier out in the world, constantly doing the work of the Father and the Son and spreading this, the, the love and the grace from their relationship out into the world. Each is fully God. Each is fully a unique person. And it's complicated infinitely more by Christ having a divine and a human nature. Once again, these are mysteries that are always going to perplex us, but they're also mysteries that drive us deeper and deeper into the relationship and to the knowledge of God. It drives us to want to know more and more about him. Okay, let's go back, okay, to this example of the watchmaker. And we can apply this uh, to the three persons of the Trinity um, as we see them revealed um, to us by our Father through Scripture and tradition. Okay, we see the unique acts of each person. We don't necessarily understand their acts fully. We necessarily don't understand each person fully. But we know that there are three unique people in our God. And they are all God. But that is how it's been revealed to us. That's how it's been revealed in Scripture. That's how we've understood it through tradition explaining Scripture. Okay, so we see three unique persons there. We know that they're never apart from each other. Right, the Father is always with the Son. Right, the, the, the father, the, you know, the father and I are one. Jesus makes that very, very, um, very, very pointed. Right, he makes that very, very clear. He and the father are one. They're not separated. And the Holy Spirit as well. Right, there's another person coming, but it's not a different God. Right, he is the same God uniquely united to them. Okay, Completely undivided, acting as one in all three thi- or in all things. So we, we, we take that example of the watchmaker. We see three persons, okay? Three unique watches sitting up on the beach. And as we open them up, we find out that they are unique, but at the same time, one. They're all three actually united as one watch. How did we used to show this? Well, the three leaf, remember the uh, three leaf clover. Um, that's the, the Irish way to show God. Three leaves on one plant. Right? You do that unique little circle thing, right? Where they're all, you know, mixed in or the triangle thing, whatever. But the, the watchmaker, uh, the point of the watchmaker, the watch is to know that there's, there's a person there. 
And it's a unique person. But at the same time, united back to this God. It has to be. If Jesus is not God, his salvation doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Right? He has to be divine in order for his uh, sacrifice to have the, fa- the effect that it does. If the Holy Spirit is not God, then he doesn't enact in us what we say he does. Um, at baptism, he doesn't give us sanctifying grace. Right? He gives us his grace, which would be incomplete if he's not God. But he is God, so it is. It's true sanctifying grace. And the Father, he's, if he's not God then he's creating us out of some other reason. He's creating us for some selfish reason or whatever. If he's not God, then he is not creating perfectly, right? So they, we, we know that they all have to be divine, but we also know that there's only one. If they're all unique divine or unique divinities of their own, eventually they clash, right? Because one has to be Uh, Bigger than the other, one has to create the other. Um, So we know that they're united because they all have the same goal. And their goal is to love. What does this all mean? What does it all look like? Well, that's unloaded over time. It's unpacked over time. But suffice it to say for now, we operate on faith, not blind faith. We don't listen to somebody tell us these things and say, well, I just believe them. And that's, that's fine. That would be enough. But we can dive into these things and we can dive into scripture, dive, drive into tradition and see these unpacked and unloaded and the beauty of this as it goes and goes and goes. We have founded truth, objective data for the existence of the Trinity. And that's what we go off of. But ultimately, it does take faith. And that's, that's where we leave it. We have faith that our God exists as he says he does and that his goal is to do nothing more than to love us into a relationship that he shares within his triune person. The Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. God bless.